Welcome back to The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. I'm Sonny Bunch, culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and I'm very pleased to be joined today by Ruth Vitale. Uh, Ruth, thanks for being on the show. Thank you for having me. Uh, so Ruth has been at the forefront of independent film production and distribution for more than three decades, including as founder and co-president of Paramount Classics and as president of Fine Line Features. Uh, during her tenure at these companies, she launched the careers of many successful filmmakers, such as Paul Greengrass, Sofia Coppola, Scott Hicks, John Hillcoat, and Craig Brewer. And I mean, there's just a ton of people on this on this bio that I that I love. Sam Raimi, Roger Mitchell, Jonathan Demme, Paul W. S. Anderson. I could go on and on. But we're here today to talk about uh, creative future. Thank you. I want to I want to talk about this because uh, as longtime listeners of the show know, I am a bit of a copyright hawk. I am uh, I have been known to joke that the little FBI warning on my DVDs needs like a, a drone strike animation to really drive home the seriousness of it. It's a it's a it's a not joke joke. It's one no. of those. And I don't I, I wouldn't ask you to endorse that sort of thing. Um, but I do. Uh, but I want to have you on the show to talk about the issue of copyright protection, which I feel like has get gotten a little bit short shrift in this age of Internet miracles in which we live. Everyone Indeed loves the has. Internet. I love the internet. You love the internet. We all we're doing the show over the internet. We, you know, things that we do wouldn't be possible without it. But it has also really made piracy not just easier, but almost standard practice for some folks. So it, what's it, what's it, go- it, indeed it has. I mean, so, go ahead. Go go ahead. I I, I just want. To, so what brought you to Creative Future? How did you get started here? Uh, tell me a little bit. Tell us all a little bit about your career and what mm-hmm. brought you here. So, uh, unlike most of my friends who are in the movie business, who want desperately, wanted like from the time they were kids to be in the business, I ended up in it by accident. I came from advertising at McCann Erickson, and uh, I was offered a job to go work at the Movie Channel in the 70s when I was working in New York. And I was like, okay, because a friend of mine was working there. She had been at McCann. So I went to the movie channel. It was my first experience in the film business. You know, I wasn't allowed to watch TV as a kid. You know, I watched Disney night Sunday night at the movies when I was a child. But other than that, uh, you know, I was just not a movie kid. So um, I worked at the movie channel for a couple years. Then I went and ran uh, the film division of Vestron, where we made Dirty Dancing, which was like, I can say this now, it was a fluke. We got a script. We loved it. We hadn't made movies. It made us cry. It made us laugh. And we made a movie. Um, The rest is sort of history. And then I went on and I came out here to United Artists. And then I worked at Get With for Gary Goldberg. And then I worked at New Line and Fine Line. And where, you know, we did Shine, most notably. And then I was recruited by Paramount to start the Classics Division, the Art House Division, and uh, David Dinnerstein partnered with me, and we were there for eight years. And then I went on to work at First Look. And then I went into sort of the independent sector, working with a group of indie filmmakers and distributors to do indie films. Mm -hmm. In 2013, I got a phone call saying, hey, there's a job opening to run this nonprofit called Creative America at the time. And I said, what is it? And it was my friend Jerry Offsay who used to run Showtime. He's retired now. And he said, it's a nonprofit that speaks up about, you know, piracy and the harms that it does to the creative community. He said, they called me about it. He goes, I think you would be interested in it. And I said, I've never heard of it. (laughs) Mm -hmm. How how long has it been around? He said, a couple years. I'm like, have you heard of it? No, I haven't heard of it. You haven't heard of it. Like, how good could it be? He said, would you just call the headhunter? I was like, all right, fine. So I don't call the headhunter because um, when you get to know me, I'm anything but obedient. I call Ron Meyer, who is then chairman of NBCU. And I say, hey, Ronnie, do you know about Creative America? He goes, oh, my God, you'd be great for that job. I'm calling Rick Cotton right now. And he hangs up the phone. I'm like, no, what? no, no, no. I wanted, I wanted you to I, – I wanted to ask about it. Then I called another uh, friend of mine who was at Fox at the time, and it turns out that he's on the board. And by the time I'm done, I've now talked to like two people, and then I get a phone call from the general counsel of NBCU who's doing the headhunting, and he said, hi, Ron tells me (laughs) that you'd be interested in this job. I'm like, oh, my God. (laughs) And I said, I'm so sorry. I didn't mean to circumvent the headhunter. I was just asking about the organization. One thing led to another. I met with everybody, and in July of 2013, they offered me the job. But uh, until that moment... 
I knew little about piracy other than the fact that when we bought a film, you know, let's say a Paramount Classics, mm -hmm. I remember a little film that we bought, a Korean film called The Way Home, and that we knew as soon as that movie came out, there were Blu-rays in the Korean markets, okay? Hustle and Flow, another movie we bought. There was the DVD in South Central with our Chiron, so it was stolen like off the lot. But when you don't really know the statistics, right, you think, well, that's cool, everybody loves our movie. Mm -hmm. But it's not cool, okay? And that was in 2007, 2008, 2004, et cetera. N now it is a, a huge billion dollar business of piracy and it's a problem. <clears throat> so I join in 2013 and Creative America had been around for two years. Uh, it had been formed by the studios, the DJA, the IA, uh, IATSE, SAG-AFTRA and CBS to mobilize the creative community to speak up about the dangers and the harm that piracy causes and the value of creativity. And I, they were formed, I don't know if you'll remember this, I didn't at the time until I took this job, there were two pieces of legislation on the Hill called SOPA PIPA, Stop Online Piracy Act, Protect IP Act in mm -hmm, 2011, sure. okay? Yeah. And everybody, every member of Congress was gonna sign the bill, which would have made streaming, criminal streaming a, a felony, because it was a misdemeanor, site blocking, which is not going to break the internet or take away your democratic freedoms, okay, but it would block your access to criminal websites that have a majority of pirated content on it. <clears throat> I guess, so I'm, you know, I'm obliviously working in the independent distribution field, but during the time on Capitol Hill, every member of Congress went away for recess at Christmas 2011. And Google launched a campaign that said, don't break the internet. And I vaguely remember thinking, oh, I, don't, I wouldn't want to break the internet. Sure. But they managed to convince people that if these bills were signed into law, that their freedom of speech rights would be violated. And I'm, I'm sort of like, you know, learning about this two years later, I'm like, how is the wholesale downloading and theft of your piece of creative material, whether it's a music, book, song, film, TV, how is that a free, how is that violating your freedom of speech rights? Are you, so when they came back from recess in January of 2012, it is my understanding that Google handed in a petition with 10 million signatures. Today, I often think, I wonder how many of those were bots. <laughs> sure. Right? Sure. But at that time, nobody yeah. was really thinking 10 about million, that. that's a lot, yeah. That, that's a lot, right? Yeah. One of the senator's offices told us that they had never seen this kind of reaction from their constituents. And it was more angry constituents than after Sandy Hook, which is a whole other discussion that just saddens me beyond <laughs> words, okay? Yeah, that's... It's just horrifying. So they were all, those bills were scuttled, never to be mentioned again, never to mention site blocking, and Creative America lay fallow. And then in 2013, the board members said, you know what, we need to do this right. And somehow <laughs> they ended up with me. Mm -hmm. And I asked the same question that many people did when I started introducing the thought of Creative America, which we renamed a Creative Future, because Creative America felt very nationalistic in a way that, like, you know, we make content all over the world. So, mm -hmm. let's, you know, it's about our future. Yeah. But, you know, when And lots of I, the piracy is does originate from overseas, right? I mean, absolutely. you get most, much of absolutely. it from China, from, yeah. from other, you know. Right. And my, mo all those criminal piracy websites, most of them operate overseas beyond our, you know, our ability to beyond our jurisdiction. So I, um, but when I went out, so I took the job and I started saying, okay, I want to recruit a base of creative members of, you know, creative community members who are my friends who make in films and television shows and ask them to come on board with me to become a voice. And, you know, you would go to, to places and talk to big producers and writers and they'll go, is it really a problem? Because you, when you're working and living in the trenches of making shows, you don't really think about piracy. 
And one of the things I think that people don't realize is it's not the studios that are just getting hurt. The residuals for the labor unions, which are health, mm -hmm. pension, and welfare, are, are the, um, the benefits are paid by residuals that the studios pay off. As piracy degrades the revenues, those, the residuals go down and the health, pension, and welfare uh, benefits suffer. So it is, it is really a problem. Um, and I can give you uh, the GIPC, uh, which is the Global Innovation Policy Center, which is part of the Chamber of Commerce, did a study last year on the losses to pir due to piracy. Mm -hmm. They estimate that anywhere from $29 billion to $70 billion a year is lost to piracy. And now let's uh, let me just ask to yeah. to in terms of uh, where that revenue is coming from. Are we talking about uh, the theatrical ticket sales, DVD sales, e where, where? everything, everything? Okay. okay. So let, let let actually it's better to go back and say so the in, the International Intellectual Property Alliance is a, a a third party organization that does work about the value of the creative communities and the core create copyright industries, which are film, television, journalism, book publishing, music, software development, gaming, is a one and a half trillion dollar annual business to this economy, to the American economy, mm -hmm. and employs 5.7 million people. Mm -hmm. And it's 7.4% of the GDP, which is larger than agriculture, aeronautics, and pharmaceuticals. So when I go to DC, I say, don't tell me we don't matter. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay, and of the 5.7 million people, two, over 2.2 million come from film and TV. Okay. And 85% of the businesses in film and TV employ less than 10 people. So when people think about big studios, big stars, yeah, big studios, big stars, but those people, those companies and big stars employ all these small cottage industries. And so going back to GIPC, 29 billion to 70 billion is lost and 230,000 to 500,000 jobs are lost every year. So, you know, when I hear the other side, my opponents in this fight say that piracy is on the on the on the down, it's ridiculous and we're like, yeah, no, it's not. Yeah. It's it is it's a huge problem. And back to your comment at the beginning of people just like, you know, it's easier on the internet. I'll tell you a story about my 98-year-old uncle Pat. <laughs> he sent me three links to a song. I can't remember whether it was a Frank Sinatra or a Tony Bennett song. And he had one sing song singing by Bobby Darin, one, you know, he had three different ones and he said, "I think I like this version better, but you're not going to like where I got them." I didn't even know what that meant because he's at the time it was like 95. So sure. I call him and I say, Uncle Pat, what are you talking about? He goes, well, those are illegal downloads. And I'm like, and this is, he's a Catholic. He's from Boston. He is like a rule follower. And I'm like, you, and I said, you, you do know what I do, right? For a living. And he said, yeah. I'm like, and you think it's okay? No, nothing. I said, so. <laughs> Let me understand this. Would you go into a store and steal those if they were CDs? And he said, well, if it was as easy as it is on the internet, sure. So when I've lost my 98 year old yeah. Uncle Pat, I, it's hard. I want to I want to talk about this because I do think there is a there, there, there are two different ways to discuss this. The first is in the pure economic terms, and I imagine that this is the best way to talk about it with senators and congressmen. Right. Say like, you are losing your lo your, your constituents are losing jobs. We're losing you know taxable revenue. You right. Know, think about all the programs. I have found in my interactions with people that normal folks do not care about this. This is not a thing that you're like your Uncle Pat, like maybe <laughs> yeah. he cares, maybe, maybe he cares. But if you bring it up that way, be like, well, OK, I get. But for the most part, they don't care enough, certainly, to stop doing what they are doing. Right. Um, which which leads me to 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 my question. How do you how do you tackle the moral valence of this with people? How do you make this a moral issue 
um, an, an issue of fairness uh, rather than simple <laughs> economics. I, I, the honest to God truth is I think that's the most difficult part. I don't know how you make it a moral argument. You, I mean, because I can guilt one person, I can guilt two people, I can guilt three people, but trying to guilt the entire world is like, you know, trying to boil the ocean, right? I don't, I don't know how we do that. And I think the only way to do it is to put a face to the workers. You know, but again, how do I do that on a consumer, you know, audience level, right? I don't have an answer. So the only thing I can do is we bring members of the creative community to DC, to the Congressional Creative Rights Caucus, where I'll bring, we just brought the Walking Dead team. And what does that mean? So I call Gail Ann Hurd, who's a friend, and she said, I can't make it, but here's Scott Gimples. He's the executive producer of the entire Walking Dead universe. And he and I talk and we decide he can make it. Denise Huth, who was the line producer, came. Michael Cudlitz, who was the one of the actors who played Abraham and, the, and also directed some, came. And Sam Ewing, the composer. Um, and that was wonderful because we put faces to this sort of anonymous, oh, these are the people that create The Walking Dead. And when you see them, and you see that we're not, I say, to interrupt my own self, I'll say, I often say that we are the victim of our own red carpet celebrity. The average audience member says they're rich, mm -hmm. they're walking red carpets, they're sitting in the back of limousines drinking champagne and eating caviar. No, here's the working people. That's why I stress that statistic of 85% of our companies of 10 people or less. Denise Huth is the, was the line producer, executive producer for The Walking Dead for all 11 seasons. She went there with Frank Darabont for the first show. And when he left, he said, oh, no, no, you need to stay here. <laughs> and she was in Georgia for 11 years, for 11 years, mm -hmm. on set every day. These jobs aren't glamorous. You know that. I know that. But I think when people see movies and television shows, they're being entertained. They're not going, wow, look at that cut. That was really difficult. Wow, look at that location. That must have been hellish to bring all the equipment in. Mm -hmm. Nobody sees those things like you do as a critic and like I do from having made movies for so long. And that is the movie magic, right? So we're also victims of movie magic that make it look really easy. And I don't, by the way, your your audience listener, anyone have an idea of how we get to people? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Well, I well, let me let's let's take it back a step to your time as a producer. When you walk on the set as a producer, how many people do you see working on? I mean, I you on a show. Let's let's just since you brought up The Walking Dead on yeah. a show of The Walking Dead size, how many people are there working behind the scenes to get it all done? How many people are working behind the scenes on a Walking Dead? I don't know. It, hundreds, if not hundreds on set. Yeah. And more than hundreds for visual effects, special effects, editing, you know, because Sam Ewing never walks on set. He's the composer. He has an entire, he works with Bear McCreary. They have, they have musicians. They have a scoring stage. So I'm going to say thousands. I think, okay. what was the movie that we saw? Top Gun employed 4,000 people. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I mean, it, the, uh, I can give you another number. So when we, went, when we brought The Walking Dead, Lee Thomas came with us. She's amazing. Um, she is the deputy film commissioner in Georgia. And she gave me the budget for The Walking Dead for season 10. Okay. I'm, and I'm looking at it right here. The total amount spent hard dollars in georgia was 57 million dollars just for this one show and of it 30 million were georgia crew hires 30 million dollars went to georgia crew if that mm -hmm. doesn't mean something for the people that live there i don't know what does right then there was another 6.9 million on georgia cast hires and then another million in zombie cast tires. <laughs> so that's 37, 38. There's still another 20 million that goes into airfares, 
catering, construction, restaurants, rentals. It bring, and the story that they tell about Sonoy, Georgia, where they shot that, is when they location scouted it, Sonny, there were six businesses on Main Street and the town was dying. People were moving out. Now Main Street is bustling with over, I think, 50 or 60 companies, healthy, working in Sonoy. And even though the show has wrapped, now it's a tourist destination. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. that one show brought in pro probably hundreds of millions of dollars eventually yeah. because yeah. 11 seasons. And Scott told us sure. that day in D.C. that they spent probably twice that on season 11, the 57. And that's hard dollars just in Georgia. That yeah. doesn't include all their salaries. Yeah. Uh, I mean, it's. It, I, I like to. I like to highlight this stuff uh, because I do think. Look, I think the actual money spent is uh, more compelling than. Um, you know, this. Whenever you bring this up with uh, folks at the EFF or whoever, uh, right? Yeah. They say. They say, oh, you know, you can't. You can't project how much money was stolen because those people wouldn't have bought a ticket anyway they wouldn't have bought the cd they wouldn't have bought the movie you know we you can't you can't you can't say that this is lost revenue it never would have been lost okay How do you respond to that okay your face you... is very angry right now i want to i like it well because i've heard this enough now that it takes every ounce of willpower for me not to lunge across the table at people okay <laughs> sitting in public knowledge and they say it's a slippery slope if you tell people they can't steal <laughs> I was sitting in Sundance with Cassian Elways. Cassian, you know, is a big producer. Um, and what did he had just done? Hurt Locker. And we're sitting having a discussion about piracy and my job, and he's on our leadership committee. And some tech kid says, those thefts, those piracy transactions are free marketing for you. At which point, I thought Cassie was going to lunge across the room at him. I'm like holding his shirt. I'm like, sit down, sit down. So we have an example that we use. Um, and I don't even know Barry Jenkins, but God bless him. So I'm going to look here. So you can remember Moonlight. Yep. It won the Oscar in a very strange way that year. <laughs> okay. Yep. It was... It grossed more than $65 million worldwide theatrically. Not much more, about 65, 66. So let's do those numbers. At $7, an average global ticket price, which is that's a, a movie ticket, that translates to approximately 9 million movie tickets sold. Okay, so 9 million people paid to go to the movies to see that, that move, that film. And that's a good amount for a small indie film, even though, by the way, it was the lowest grossing best picture to date, okay? But what few people don't know about Moonlight is there were also about 60 million online piracy transactions. So nine times more people stole it than bought tickets, right? So that's more than 650,000%. A 650% more pirate views than paid ticket sales. But so, but here's the thing. So I got used to the EFF saying, well, they wouldn't buy a ticket anyway. Let's say that even if 5% of those pirated transactions were legal transactions and not even a movie ticket, because if 5% at $7, the film would have earned an additional $21 million, okay? But if 5% just paid rental streams at $3.99 a stream, that would have earned the film an additional $12 million. Now, I happen to know that that movie took eight years to make, and it was a million and a half dollars. Uh, one of our friends worked on the film. She came to DC with us on another picture. She worked pretty much for free, you know, for minimum wage, hoping for a back end, because that's, you know, those indie films, everyone like, mm -hmm. it's like a fraternal, you know, like yeah. everyone digs in, doesn't make a lot of money, and hopes that they're gonna be the one that breaks out. So, they didn't make that $12 million. Never mind, like the 60 million times. Okay, but they didn't even make the extra $12 million. Okay, because people thought, I'm not gonna, I'm not gonna buy it. I'm gonna steal it. Yeah. And that's not okay. Yeah. It just isn't. So when they say that's free marketing, no, it isn't. It's bullshit.
I don't know if I'm allowed to yeah. swear on your show, but. Ah, that's fine. It is bullshit. I will co-sign. Thank you. That bullshit. Uh, it is absolutely bullshit, me. and we hear yeah. it all the time. Yeah. Yeah, no, I uh, this is a a, a a a pet peeve of mine as well. I, there There is a, such a thing as free marketing, but giving away the thing for free is not free marketing. It's just giving away the thing for free. And, and when I hear from public knowledge, who I have sat with, that it is a slippery slope to not allowing people to have whatever they want online, I'm like, I'm sorry, how is the wholesale theft of a piece of material that you own okay? It's not okay in any other world. Yeah. I mean, there's also, there's a certain amount of entitlement to it as well, because the other argument that you hear is... Well, this movie wasn't playing in a theater near me, so I had to, I had to pirate it online. Or I, uh, you know, I I don't I don't think I should have to. I mean, I, it all it all boils down to I don't think I should have to wait to see it, and I don't think I should have to pay four dollars to rent it on uh, Amazon. And the, the I don't think I should have to pay to see it. I sort of get okay. I'm not I'm not I'm not condoning it. I'm not blessing it. There's enough things that you can see that are already available. Who died and made you in charge of I get to see it first? Okay? That mm -hmm. like that doesn't cut it. But the what was what was the other one that you said? The Well, it's there's the the people who don't want to wait. Oh, the wait. Which, oh, and then which, I, which yeah. I kind of get. Yeah, that's I, what I, I say. I, I, yeah. And I the people of... that don't want to pay. This is what really makes me angry. You walk by a Starbucks Okay, and you see people paying six to ten dollars for coffee drinks that I can't even pronounce. Okay, because I don't drink coffee, and I think they're okay doing that, but they don't want to pay three ninety nine for a stream. Like, how is that okay? You got a you got a cell phone. Everyone's paying money for a cell phone. I don't know when it became okay to take from us, except for. The other side did a really good job of breaking the narrative, okay? It is a broken narrative. We do matter. We are a huge employer of humans. And by the way, the skilled labor in film and television, I think the average income in America is around seventy, seventy-five thousand dollars $75,000, which is actually high. But the average income in film and TV is about $104,000, $107,000. Those are jobs you want to protect. Those mm -hmm. are jobs you want to get kids into. Because costs sure are not going down. <laughs> Everything's yeah. going up. Yeah. So that's what I don't understand. It's like, oh, I'm entitled and I don't want to pay. Yeah. No, that's about it. that. That is the long and the short of it. I mean, I it is it is uh, incredibly frustrating. All right. So so that's we've we talked a little bit about. Yeah. Um, the, the demand side of things. Let's let's talk a little bit about the supply side of things because there was a there was an interesting piece uh, that you guys linked to uh, on your site. Uh, the, it was an op-ed in the Hill about uh, tools that tech companies have that uh, can help stop piracy on on websites like YouTube and elsewhere. Yep. But they don't share with everyone. Tell tell me what that's about because it's it's fascinating to me that this exists <clears throat> and they they're like keeping it away from the indie producers. Yeah, they are keeping it away from the indie producers. Um, uh, they have content protection tools, uh, YouTube in particular does, okay? And they give them to the studios uh, and they give them to the music studios, okay? Because theft on YouTube is huge. It's like the number one, mm -hmm. we joke about saying it's the number one pirate site. You know, it has a lot of legitimate stuff. Everybody uses mm -hmm. it. I use it. We're, by the way, the other thing that the other side likes to paint us as is a bunch of Luddites. And I, that makes me really angry because I'm mm -hmm. thinking our technology that has been developed in film alone shows that we're not Luddites. Okay. We embrace technology at every step. So they have content protection tools, uh, but they don't, they say that they're very, very, very sophisticated. Uh, and they are. Okay, not to take away from that. Okay, many of the studios and music studios who have them have more than a you know more than a small department to manage the theft and what you decide that you're going to use. Let them monetize and the stuff that you want to pull down. Okay, so it takes a full time it takes a full time staff to take care of it. Mm -hmm. But the tools that they allow for smaller indies are useless. They're useless. And so we're in the process of talking with them 
And at least they've opened up a dialogue now, okay, the people mm-hmm. at YouTube, to say, we're saying it doesn't work. Let's figure out something, an aggregator perhaps, but we need to allow all the independent filmmakers who own their copyright to be able to monitor um, uh, theft on YouTube. Uh, we have a friend, he's a composer, and somehow as an individual, he got Content ID, which is the number one content protection tool on YouTube. He got it years ago. And he goes, I don't know how I got it. Because <laughs> not very many individuals have it. Mm-hmm. But he spends eight hours a day policing his, his music. And he said it makes him blind with rage. Because it's very hard, especially to find music, right? Because it's like snippets mm-hmm. and people will, you know, foreign international companies will use them in uh, commercials. And he has to catch all that. And I said, you shouldn't have to be doing that. You should be creating. Your job is to create music so that you can make a living. Not to monitor these tech platforms who could help do it. Because so even content ID is imperfect, right? But it is a start. And yes, they should give it to more people. And I think they know that. We're, I, I work with um, Jean, I don't know if you know Jean Pruitt. She's the CEO of Independent Film and Television Alliance, IFTA, which has the AFM in, in mm-hmm. November here. And she and I and our teams have been working with YouTube to say, you need to make this better. Yeah. You know, and so... I, well, but- why do, why do you walk me through what the process uh, f- for this is? Because I, I, I'll just tell the story uh, yeah. uh, an independent <clears throat> producer told me once. We were sitting down just having lunch, and he just mentioned, you know, you know, somebody sent me a link to our whole movie on YouTube. Just sitting there, and, I, I you know, I could spend all day emailing YouTube takedown notices yeah. of each, but I don't have time for that. I can't, I can't. Our, deal with this. Our, this isn't... Yeah, our industry sends 900 million takedown notices a year to Google and YouTube alone. And that's not because we have 900 million pieces of content. It's because that link, if he can prove he's the copyright owner, he can send a notice to Google. Okay, they will take down that URL. And then if the pirate is sophisticated, he'll put up a new URL and it'll be up the next day. And so it's what's been recalled as whack-a-mole. You get it here, then it comes up here. You get it here, you get it up here. So that's why the next piece of legislation that we would like to see is what's you know blocking access to pirate sites. It's called site blocking in other countries. It's in 35 countries around the world. Freedom of speech hasn't been violated and democracy hasn't fallen. Well, it may have fallen, but it didn't fall because of site blocking. Yeah. Not funny, I, very let's... dark humor. Let's 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 talk. Uh, let's talk a little bit about this because look, I am uh, as uh, as a libertarian leaning sword. I do get a little I get a little itchy when I hear the government talk about you know wanting to take down or block access to sites. Yes, um, it's certainly within their power. I remember the I remember the day when all of the online poker sites went down, for instance. Oh I, wow, like, I don't it's know a thing, that. It's a thing they can do. Okay, uh, so I know I know they have the power. But what? So t- tell well, me, tell me what what you guys would well the way uh, it works the way the way it works in every other country and it works that way in every other it's thirty five plus countries it may be over forty okay but it's it's all like the U K and Germany and Japan and Italy it's like all your democratic you know countries all of our partners in the fight for freedom uh, if if a site can be proven in a court of law to carry all pirated material or mostly pirated material, the, the court, not us, not the government, but a court will rule that the internet service providers, okay, have to block access. So for instance, if I'm in, I live in the UK uh, and I want to get to Pirate Bay, I can't unless I know the actual address, okay? If I can type in the address, I can get there, but they're not going to provide it in their search. You won't find it. Mm-hmm. Okay. Um, so our opponents are now say, well, it's not going to cure piracy altogether. But Carnegie Mellon, I don't know if you, Carnegie Mellon, there's a professor there, Mike Smith. He's a, he's a good friend and a great colleague. He did a study in the UK after a couple of years of site blocking on major sites. And he saw that legitimate viewing went up and illegitimate viewing went down because most people want to do the right thing. 
I can't tell you how many times I've heard from even a friend. Yeah, I was out of the country and I wanted to watch the, you know, the, the, the football match in the UK and I couldn't find it anywhere and I found it online and then I clicked on it and I like I'm about to give them my credit card and I realized it's a pirate site. Okay, most people, we're never going to cure the died, die hard piracy, piracy mm -hmm. person. Never. Okay, but if search results show you up sites and by the way sonny if you've seen them one of these days we'll get in the same city and we have a pirate living room which we show people with the ease with which you can pirate and you we have a closed internet for that because also when you pirate there's a 30 percent chance that you're going to have malware hit your hit your computer yeah tom galvin digital citizens alliance has done a study so but it's so easy if you just go watch top gun free and then yeah. they'll all come up. So site blocking would block the sites that are adjudicated in a court of law to show that they are criminal piracy sites. These criminal piracy sites, they're making an average site makes $3 million a year. Mm -hmm. They don't have to do anything other than- And this is from, this is from ads? Like either Google ads, ads or... or subscriptions. Mm -hmm. Okay. Okay. And- they're part of verticals because it's a very cheap vertical to run. What do you need? A server and someone to give you the film, right? Mm -hmm. And they have been linked. Piracy has been linked to criminal, criminal organizations that have arms dealing, sex trafficking, child trafficking, drugs, the whole gamut. Jonathan Junger who is a co-chair of Millennium Films where they make Rambo, The Expendables and stuff. He's, he's, a, he's on our leadership committee. He's testified in DC with us and he is a rabbit about piracy. And he found, they found a DVD outlet in the Philippines and he worked with Interpol and, and Homeland Security and it was shut down. And they were, Al they were funding Al Qaeda. Mm -hmm. So, you know, when people go, oh, baloney. No, no, no. These are, this isn't, this isn't a kid in a basement stealing. Yes, the end consumer is a kid in a basement. But yeah. the people that are yeah. putting forth these websites, this isn't you and me making muffins and like selling, you know, illegal DVDs on the side. These are criminal operations. Uh, I do have a great muffin and bootleg DVD <laughs> shop, but, you know, that is a conversation. <laughs> I know. I would like to have, time. like, a coffee shop and, like, you know, DVDs. So, you know, it is – I am a bit of a libertarian myself. I don't really know what I am anymore because the politics have gotten so confusing to me. But um, I, I don't think our rights should be taken away from us. But you know what? There shouldn't be criminal piracy sites yeah. online. Yeah, that are no, taking a, a, yeah. they're taking money out of the pockets of hardworking Americans. Yeah, I I, I do want to I want to loop back to that because I mean we we talked we touched briefly on uh, the way residuals work essentially. You yeah, know? I, I, and and I do think I, I think it's worth just highlighting briefly uh, for people who don't know who don't understand the industry don't don't really know you know what what a residual is how 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 do those uh, how do those uh, how do payments from you know cable deals from uh, streaming deals from DVD sales Blu-ray sales etc uh, help fund you know the the retirement funds the health funds and all that right so I'm not I'm not gonna get this completely right okay but okay. when a studio does a deal there are residuals that go to the, the to the guilds through the actors and the directors and the um, below the line workers okay mm -hmm. and those are residuals are funded right from the flow of money from theatrical and dvd and you know svod and avod etc as piracy affects those revenues we you know we just went through the numbers on moonlight there's less back end for anybody and those pension and welfare and health benefits get are affected. Just by the way, just like if you wonder why you only see tent poles in the movie theaters anymore, it's because I always I call it the George Clooney movie. The George Clooney movie has disappeared, right? Good night and good mm -hmm. luck, Michael Clayton. 
because now you people feel they can see them on television and you know i'm not going to whine that is just the sort of the the evolution of our business right Mm -hmm. but if you want to see a thoughtful piece you're not going to the movies to see it for the most part although i'm going to put in a huge plug for top gun because i loved it (laughs) Great movie. We've Great talked movie. about it a lot here. Oh, yeah. I love Good it. Good movie. Right. Go see it. Right. But um, so less movies in theaters, okay? Less thoughtful movies in theaters because if you think you're only going to do $100 million at the box office, it's sort of like you're not going to get out of bed that morning, right? Because you, mm-hmm. mm-hmm. you need to cover all the costs of paying your crews and your actors funding those residuals, the, all you know, like p- the print and advertising, the th- half of it goes to the theaters. It is a very, very expensive business. Like, I, yeah. I, I don't know a whole lot of business that say, hey, I'm going to put $200 million down on red and hope for the best. Yeah, yeah. That is, I mean, that is the, the Hollywood system right there. It's, uh, it's uh, nobody knows anything. It's all, it's all a crapshoot. And, and by the way, so. I really tip my hat. Like, you know, I ran indie studios and indie studios are different, right? It's like whether you buy Shine or, you know, I make Mortal Kombat, you know, the numbers are small. They're infinitesimal. When you have to green light a two to $400 million movie, 10 times a year i'd have a nervous breakdown Mm. Mm -hmm. (laughs) that's like that's not even money it's money beyond my comprehension yeah and then spending another 100 million to 150 million just here to market it yeah yeah the numbers are big i mean like this is i I, you know we we talk a lot about box office uh on this show and elsewhere and i I, it is it it it, people see those numbers people see you know oh well top gun maverick has made 300 dollars, 300 million dollars you know it must be it must be you know it's already hugely profitable and maybe with ford in there too but it's you know it that's 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 the problem gross a million bucks Probably. I don't know, because what did it cost? 150, 175 million. They probably put another 150 million in. Okay. So that's already 300 million in sunk costs. Okay. If you did 300 million at the box office here, they only get 50% of that. Okay. Then they have to market all the ancillaries and then overseas. You know, when my mom (laughs) was alive and she'd call me and she goes, oh, you know, the Avengers, it did like a billion dollars or whatever. And um, that's what people think. Again, Victims of red carpet celebrity, victims of ma- movie magic. They think that, oh, we're swimming in dough. How many movies don't make it? Yeah. Yeah. There's a lot of lot of uh, red ink there. Yeah. That's for sure. And that's why piracy is just an, I mean, I, it's the biggest source of lost revenue. There, What else is there? Do you know? Yeah. Yeah. So what, what, what do you, what would you... Uh, let's look at uh, potential solutions here. If you if you had uh, two minutes to say sit down with the Biden administration, and say here's the thing, here's what we need to do. This is this is our number one uh, wish list item. We're what is it? we're Go. actually in the process of talking with members of Congress about how we can disrupt access to criminal sites. Okay, how we can block access. It's going to be a long slog. Um, I don't think anybody, even EFF or public knowledge, would say criminal websites should be available. But, you know, you're going to hear every argument that there is. It's like, well, if it's not going to be 100% fix, why bother? Because every little thing helps. And by the way, one, you know, God willing, we get to disrupt access like 35 plus other countries do. Then what's the next thing? The problem with technology and the problem with the laws as they were written, because we have the Digital Millennium Copyright Act from 1998, which was if there's piracy, you send a notice, they take it down. It was, you know, the internet was at its infancy. Mm -hmm. Nobody could have imagined that today we'd be sending 900 million takedown notices a year to one company, right? Sure. So I think what's great about this, all the administrations, including, I will say this, the Trump administration, Republicans actually, interestingly, care more about copyright. They look at it as a personal property right. 
that it is a constitutional law. We have friends on the Democratic side, but the people that have really taken this to heart are the Republicans, which was shocking for me, a liberal kid from Boston going to D.C. Mm -hmm. and going, wow, Doug Collins, congressman from Georgia, is our hugest, largest, most avid fan and supporter. You know, he went and run, ran for Senate, so he's not around anymore. We're still friends. Mm -hmm. Senator Tom Tillis, another one, North Carolina Republican senator, huge, huge, huge supporter of copyright protections. So we're working, you know, we have friends on both sides of the aisle. Jerry Nadler, you know, he's head of the, um, uh, the you know, judiciary in the House. We have good friends. And our job at Create a Future is to bring shows to D.C. to say, here are the people. Here are the people that are bringing these shows to your town, you know, your, your, to your constituents. You need to protect their work so that they can continue to do it. So that's, you know, that's what I'm, I've been doing this for 10 years. Just think. Yeah. <laughs> long time i know it's, it's a, a long, long time. time and the interesting thing about the biden administration is we haven't been able to get president biden's or the white house to appoint an intellectual property enforcement coordinator it's called the ipec and mm -hmm. uh it's been vacant since he came into office and he was a huge copyright supporter in, in the senate mm -hmm. i'm not sure what the problem is i've written an op-ed other people have written op-eds incessantly stayed in touch with the White House, but it has not been a priority for them. And it, it's unfortunate. Yeah. Uh, hopefully uh, somebody over there is listening. We can I know. get that taken care of. <laughs> Thank uh, you. We'll see. We'll see. <laughs> uh, I, well, I always like, that was everything I wanted to ask. Okay. I always like to, to close these interviews by asking if there's anything I should have asked. If there's anything you think people should know about okay, the world know. of copyright, the world is there, of... Is there anything that you should have asked? I don't know. Let me think. No, I don't. I think you were pretty thorough. I, I, I would say to your audience, please remember, it's not just Tom Cruise, who I adore and I think is worth every penny that he gets. It's the thousands of workers who work with him to put his vision on the screen. And they're just regular people trying to get their kids through school and put food on their tables. And it's a good living. And I don't understand why anyone would want to steal from somebody. I just, yeah. it's wrong. God, I sound like my mother yeah. now. It's wrong. It's wrong. It's don't wrong. Do it. God damn it. Don't do it. Don't steal. Just don't All right, do that's, it. That's, that's, that's also how I feel. I, uh, you know, it's I'm glad these, I uh, found a fellow, a, fe a, fe a fellow traveler in this journey. Cause it's honestly, there's days, you know, what's interesting. One thing that I will tell you and your audience, when we first started going to D.C. and started talking about piracy, we'd be like, the house is on fire. Members of Congress staffers, you have to pay attention. And they'd be like, would you like a glass of water? <laughs> we would walk out of those meetings and we go, they probably say, those poor people, they're never going to get anywhere. But we have felony, criminal criminal streaming, not you as a consumer, me as a consumer, audience members, pirate sites that were doing streaming, criminal streaming was a misdemeanor. And the Department of Justice couldn't go after them because at a misdemeanor, they'd have to get them on money laundering. Mm -hmm. We worked with Senator Tillis and Senator Leahy in 2020 during the pandemic had a series of, was it 2020? It was, well, yeah. It, 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 and we got felony streaming as a bill. It's called Protecting Lawful Streaming Act. And now the Department of Justice can go after criminal enterprises that are streaming criminal, you know, pirated material. Trump signed it into law in December of 2020. And we met with the Department of Justice when we were there in April and it gives them the ability right to go after these criminal enterprises not after a student no. not after your grandmother not after right. my uncle pat okay but after the people that are facilitating this wholesale piracy so there's yeah. hope and then again god damn it don't do it 
<laughs> don't steal. Don't steal. <laughs> My name is Sonny Bunch. I'm the culture editor at The Bulwark. Uh, and thanks again to Ruth for being on the show. I will be back next week with another episode of The Bulwark Goes to Hollywood. See you guys then. You love Lala Kent on Vanderpump Rules. Now get to know her on Give Them Lala. With her assistant, Jess. Normal people don't write negative comments on people's Instagram. Right. They don't have to listen to this podcast. They don't have to buy tickets to come see my show. No yeah. one's forcing them to do anything. They're doing it because there's something that they relate to in me and I relate to in them. That sends chills all up my body. Yes. Give Them Lala. Listen wherever you get your podcasts.